We certainly have some visitors here today, so I'll just say that I'm Abby Thompson. I'm the director of the Cosmos program. This is our third distinguished lecture. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Tony Tyson. Professor Tyson received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin in 1967. He has held positions at the University of Chicago and at Bell Labs, and in 2004, we were lucky enough to be able to lure him to UC Davis, where he is one of a very small handful of distinguished professors on campus. His honors are many and include membership in the National Academy of Sciences, to which he was elected in 1997. We're also extremely fortunate to have him serve as a member of the statewide advisory board to the COSMOS program. Professor Tyson directs the next major survey facility of the universe, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which will be located in Chile. Thought so, but it's not there yet, right? No, okay. In 2010, the LSST was ranked as the top new ground-based facility in astrophysics. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tyson. Thanks, Avi. It's, it's good to be here and um, look forward to your questions um, afterwards. And uh, I'll stick around for a while. So I think being a scientist uh, working at the frontiers of any area of science is, is a lot of fun, and especially fun if you have no idea what you're doing. That is to say, if you're totally mystified by what you're trying to re uh, look into. Um, and, and this is particularly true of what we do uh, in astrophysics. Uh, in trying to understand the missing, uh, trying to understand the 96 percent of the universe that we um, have no idea um, what the origin is. And so um, the take home message is it's a lot of fun and physics is incomplete and, and because of that we know there's new physics right around, right around the corner which makes it, makes it exciting. So I'm going to start you on a cosmic journey and I'll explain some of this uh, as I go along. But uh, we know uh, from a number of sources that the universe appeared to, uh, appeared to have started everywhere, not in one place, but everywhere in the universe that we know, started at some time in the past in a huge so-called very hot Big Bang. And so that's here. This is um, billions of uh, some, some uh, almost 14 billion years ago. Um, we know that. Uh, because uh, there is some remnant radiation from that fire, from that hot Big Bang uh, that arrives at us here today, and I'll explain how you can do that um, to detect it yourself if you want. Uh, and that's this stuff, which I'll explain in a minute. And then, of course, after some period of time that we, this is the so-called dark ages, we <laughs> dark because we don't understand what's going on, uh, apparently stars and galaxies started forming via a mechanism which, very frankly, we don't understand. So there's a lot we don't understand in astrophysics, but it's something else which is even more mysterious that I want to talk to you about today. Um, and then these galaxies um, expanded uh, by the expansion of the universe because uh, the mean distance, sort of the average distance between any two points in the universe is expanding from this huge explosion. And there are various ways we can uh, research this and look at the universe, I look back through cosmic time and try to understand uh, what happened by effectively running the movie backwards. So here's what uh, the latest map of this remnant radiation from this Big Bang um, looks like. It's now, uh, it was very, very hot at the time, but of course the universe has expanded and stretched the wavelengths of all the photons of light. And so this um, radiation is actually now in the, in the microwave range. And if you get hold of your parents, or actually grand grandparents, old television in the garage somewhere, tucked away, turn it on and put it between a couple of broadcast stations, you just get static. But a fair fraction of that static is actually this microwave radiation coming, depending upon the antenna that you happen to hook it up to. So uh, that's, in fact, the way it was found. It's really cool. Um, they couldn't understand why there was this static coming from everywhere in the sky uh, back in the 60s at Bell Labs. So what happens if you go out to a nice site, this is in Hawaii where these are the twin Keck telescopes and the 
sun is setting and you're in the control room uh, and the sky is getting darker and you walk outside and you look at the sky top of a very high mountain, dark mountain, uh, no lights around, shielded by the way by that lower layer of clouds. Um, the sky gets darker and darker and darker and eventually uh, you have maybe, if we could turn these lights off here, uh, you could see uh, just a few uh, stars um, and in between the stars it's uh, completely dark. That is to say you don't see anything. You can point the telescope in between the stars and you'll see more of course because it's a huge collecting area compared to the few mill millimeters of your eye. But um, it's still dark and uh, this whole story continues no matter how big the telescope is. It's darkness between stars and galaxies. And so the picture that um, astronomers uh, inherited uh, uh, with this experience uh, um, all the way up to uh, the 1930s and beyond was that uh, there were stars, there were galaxies, um, and that's about it. Uh, the rest is empty darkness, empty space, nothing. Yet uh, we now understand that picture is not true. And that is to say, uh, there's an invisible network of something that uh, is much more massive and controls the destiny of the universe uh, in between, in this darkness, in between these stars and galaxies. And this is uh, dark matter. And I'm going to show you today how to take a picture of it, if you want to. It's invisible. How do you take a picture of something that's invisible? That's, that's an interesting homework assignment. Um, but we figured out how to do that. This stuff is called dark matter. We don't actually know what it is, but we have some actually viable candidates for what it is. Uh, it may be some leftover particle from the, um, from the Big Bang, from the very hot Big Bang that uh, we haven't generated yet in the biggest accelerators that we have uh, in physics. Um, and, and this particle has a little tiny bit of mass and it fills the universe. It actually, there's so much of it actually, it controls our destiny gravitationally. It's much more massive than anything else in the universe in terms of its, in terms of its mass um, density. And so uh, here's a movie of a simulation of a cluster of galaxies. Galaxies tend to cluster because of gravity. They cluster together, but there's something unseen uh, in clusters of galaxies. And this unseen dark matter is responsible for keeping the cluster together. Uh, if the cluster didn't have all of this dark matter, uh, the cluster of galaxies would fly apart in very little time compared to the known lifetime of clusters. This was actually discovered in the late 30s, believe it or not, and nobody believed it. Uh, the guy that discovered it uh, was a bit zany, uh, so that give, gave extra reason to <laughs> not believe it. But uh, Fritz Zwicky published a, a, a great article in a, in a physics journal in 1937, basically uh, laying out the complete uh, detection and observation of this dark matter. So how did he come to the conclusion that there was dark matter? Because he couldn't see it. He didn't, we didn't yet have tools uh, to actually make images of it. What he did was he got a spectrograph and he looked at the velocity of these galaxies in the cluster. And they're just swarming around, you know, like bees. They're swarming around and some galaxies are moving towards you and their spectrum is blue shifted to the blue wavelengths, shorter wavelengths. And some galaxies are moving away from you and by the Doppler effect, um, their spectra are being red shifted uh, to longer wavelengths. And he looked at this, uh, these, this dispersion of velocities of the galaxies and was amazed to find that the galaxies are zipping around far faster than they should be if he assigned one solar mass in, of mass to each solar luminosity in the galaxies. So something was really wrong and he called this oddly enough missing mass but actually it was mass that was discovered and not explained. It was later coined dark matter. So this was the first discovery of dark matter and now we have hundreds of these clusters mapped exquisitely with, with actual images of the dark matter itself, which is really a lot of fun. So the dark universe contains um, another component 
dark energy, which is even more mysterious. Uh, a friend of mine uh, once said that uh, we understand less than zero about dark energy, and, and, um, and, and he's right. Uh, we have no viable models of what that is, but the dark matter and dark energy together uh, make up um, actually over 95% of the contents of our universe in terms of mass energy, and we don't understand really the physics of either one of them. So just to bring the point home, here's a pie chart of the composition of our known universe. And uh, here are these little tiny slices here. Uh, let's see. Uh, this slice up here is um, the stuff we're made out of. Heavy elements, carbon, whatever, everything else. Rocks, dust, stars, it's all there. Uh, neutrinos have a little slice. They have a little tiny bit of mass, which is really interesting because that's physics beyond the standard model itself. Um, and other things, free hydrogen, uh, there's hydrogen gas in the universe, uh, but it's a little sliver still. Most of this composition by weight of the universe or by mass energy is in the form of, of dark matter, that's this, and this mysterious, totally mysterious dark energy. And don't take anything home, uh, don't, don't think that you somehow understand this better by knowing the name that we assign to it. You know, people assign names to things they don't understand because it's easy to get funding. Uh, but in fact, um, um, uh, I, I think that these, these two things have nothing to do with one another and um, it's dark mainly because uh, we're dense and don't understand what it is. So here is, um, here's where life is. This is all this, life is made out of, as you well know, um, uh, composed of, of uh, these, these heavy elements, and yet uh, this wouldn't exist were it not for the fact that clustering of gas and creation of stars and planets um, uh, to generate these, uh, and stars to generate these heavy elements occurred in the first place, and that's because of the gravitational influence of dark matter. So were it not for dark matter, we wouldn't be here. Sort of an interesting universe. Um, so how do you actually see this stuff? How do we know it's there? Uh, and, and the way we can know it's there is through its gravitational influence. So Einstein um, taught us that, in fact, uh, one way of looking at gravity is not some kind of mysterious force that you learn in high school and write down if, you know, uh, some, some kind of, of uh, force as a function of distance and mass, some formula, but in fact, that mass itself distorts the actual fabric of space-time locally around it, and that's uh, indicated here by this artist's conception of a distorted space-time, and, and something that's orbiting a massive object, like maybe the sun, like the Earth is orbiting, um, is orbiting it uh, not, not because of some, some mysterious formula, but actually because of the warping of space-time, the natural warping of space-time around this mass uh, due to the presence of the mass. So there's a relationship between this warping of space-time and mass, and Einstein derived that. That's his general theory of relativity. And then he made a prediction. He said, okay, if uh, this theory is right, it should be that uh, the, um, the sun, with all of its mass, would deflect the light from a distant star that's just grazing the sun, or behind the sun, a star that's way behind. This light grazes the sun. He made a little diagram in his notebook. Uh, and it's deflected by a certain angle. And, um, and this is a letter that he wrote to a friend in, um, in uh, 1913, uh, and, and uh, 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 outlining this so-called light, gravitational light bending. And then uh, several ex 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 eclipse expeditions were undertaken um, to look for this effect. Of course, you have to do it during eclipse, an eclipse because there's no way that you're going to look from the Earth at a background star right at the limb of the sun because the sun's too bright and too much scattered light in the atmosphere. So you have to wait for that sunlight to be blocked by the moon. And uh, here's a telegram from one of those uh, eclipse expeditions uh, saying, indeed, uh, uh, this is from Campbell's expedition in uh, 1919, saying, indeed, uh, 1.278 arc seconds uh, was the deflection angle at that 
um, radius. This created a, uh, a huge worldwide acclaim for Einstein because it was a confirmation, probably uh, one of the most important ones, there were others by the way, of his general theory of relativity. Fast forward to the mid 80s, um, we dreamed uh, of being able to do this with galaxies, but it had never been really done before. Uh, we dreamed of the, the following so-called Einstein ring possibility. This is an artist's conception. Suppose you're here on the Earth and you're looking at light from some very distant galaxy, and that light um, travels towards you, and it, 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 it might be that, that in between this distant galaxy and Earth, there's this huge pile of dark matter, huge amount of mass decorated by the artist here with galaxies, um, and uh, the unseen dark matter is so massive that it actually can bend the light, so this light can, of course, come straight through, and you can see the straight through, through image, uh, but it also could be bent, and you'd see it from coming from over here, and etc. And you would create, just with the perfect alignment, sort of a ring, Einstein ring. And so uh, some of us were looking through astronomical imaging, searching for these things, and uh, we found one, candidate. Uh, we, we then um, decided, well, maybe we ought to take a closer look, um, and, and uh, went to the Hubble Space Telescope to look at this thing. And, and this is the uh, computer reconstructed image of the galaxy that's behind the cluster. So this galaxy is about 12 billion light years away. This is only one arc second from here to here, very small. Picture of a computer reconstructed image of a distant galaxy. But in this direct image from the Hubble Space Telescope, you can see pictures of it in different places in the field. So here's the direct straight through image of that galaxy. But here it is again. Here it is again, and again, and again, and again. This is a nascent part of an Einstein ring uh, from all of the unseen dark matter that's piled up in this cluster of galaxies. These, these um, yellowish things are the galaxies in the cluster. That's from the old light, from old yellow, reddish stars. No new hot blue stars being born from this old cluster. And uh, this is a cluster much like I showed you in that simulation uh, a moment ago in that movie. Uh, but what you, don't, of course, don't see in this image is the dark matter that's doing the work. Uh, the galaxies in these, uh, the actual galaxies have mass. Most of the mass of the galaxies is, is in fact dark matter. Uh, but there's a, another distribution, of, um, much more of the dark matter is diffuse. So we had a, a supercomputer uh, think for an entire year about uh, it took a year to run, uh, uh, to reconstruct an image of the dark matter that could possibly have been uh, given rise to this particular arrangement. Um, and this was the, the uh, unique solution that we found to, for this. You can see these spikes. So this is, a, this is a, a, a topo map of dark matter in this cluster. The spikes are the dark matter that is clinging to those individual cluster galaxies. Um, but then there's the majority component is this sort of Gaussian big fat, uh, dominant uh, component of dark matter that's, um, that's responsible for the light bending of, of the whole cluster. Uh, that doesn't tell us what it is, but it tells, tells us what it is not. That is to say, certain candidates for dark matter can't do these two things at the same time. They can't simultaneously cling very nicely to galaxies and not sort of free stream away like sandcastles at high tide. Um, and also um, collect into a big Gaussian distribution. So this immediately eliminated a few candidates, but we're still left not knowing exactly what it is. But, you know, these things happen only it's uh, th this, this sort of thing here. Let me back up. This, so this sort of arrangement happens only at certain very, very special places in the sky where you happen to have this arrangement where there's a, just an accidental chance arrangement of a background galaxy behind a foreground massive cluster. Um, there are only probably a thousand places or maybe more uh, in the sky uh, where, that can be, uh, where that can be true. Uh, but what about just mapping the dark matter anywhere? Well, because of all of the uh, dark matter that fills the universe, even outside of these clusters, uh, all the distant galaxies in star, uh, all the distant galaxies are at the wrong place. Their images have been moved. And so one way of ask, answering this question, how can we actually go and, and, and map uh, and image the rest of the dark universe, 
um, is through this generalized cosmic mirage. So no matter where you point your telescope, you don't have to be pointing it at a cluster, you can be pointing it anywhere, all those galaxies way, way far away are in the wrong place because their light has also been bent by the intervening piles of dark matter, although they're not quite as dramatic as in clusters of galaxies. And so I'm going to show you a movie here. And the, what I did was billion years, I think that's what she did. Uh, and of course, she managed to finish this before the end of the summer. Um, and so I'm going to see if I can run this movie. So this is the movie. Um, so, so we're following the cluster as it moves, uh, trucks through the universe. And what happens then, of course, is the background galaxies pan by behind. And you can see uh, in this movie, it's a movie's worth a, a thousand equations. <laughs> uh, you can see uh, all the various uh, really unique kinds of um, nascent Einstein rings and other peculiar uh, topological effects uh, due, to the, uh, due to this gravitational light bending and this imperfect lens of the distribution of dark matter. These are imperfect lenses and therefore you get a very strange kind of parity shift between here and here. You can see that's radial alignments of, of images and here it's tangential. So that's, that told us what to look for, and then we went out and looked for it and designed computer programs to automatically find this stuff. And so here's a picture of the telescope we used in a lot of our work. Uh, this is the four meter telescope in Chile, uh, northern Chile, the sun's going down, getting ready to, for a night's observing, Sty sky's getting darker. Uh, and then we take a lot of images of all these distant galaxies and put it through this computer program that looks for these tangential alignments of distant galaxies anywhere in the sky, anywhere in the sky. It looks for these tangential alignments and then says, aha, around this point, there's such and such amount of tangential alignment, therefore I'm going to put a mass component on that mass pixel map. And this is a pixel, this is a map, not of light, but of mass done in that way. Each one of these uh, pixels in this mass correspond to a place in the sky um, where we looked for this telltale tangential alignment. And this is, in fact, a a, a mass map looking through uh, the universe um, out to very high redshift of the uh, projected mass density in dark matter. So this is pri primarily over densities of dark matter. Uh, we've confirmed that by looking at some of these things with an X-ray telescope and we see X-rays coming from it because of the deep uh, gravitational potential wells due to all this mass in dark matter uh, compressing the uh, electrons and therefore you know when you compress a gas it gets hot and compressed electrons emit x-rays. And so um, we can also split this up. It's really fun. We can do tomography with this. We can actually know the distance to these galaxies by the redshifted spectral lines in the galaxies. And we can, uh, since we know the distances um, and we measure the mass, uh, we can do tomography by splitting this image up into multiple um, images at different distances and look at the growth of structure through cosmic time. So um, that gets to a tool which uh, allows you to address this other more curious question. Uh, by the way, this is one of our employees. Uh, up on, if you're up in the fifth floor of the physics building late at night on the weekends, you might run into this guy. Um, uh, this is dark energy, okay? So what in the world is dark energy? Um, if we have some candidates for dark matter, I told you already we have zero um, physically well-motivated candidates for what this stuff is. Dark energy is just a word. It's a word for an effect that was found by one of the cameras that we built in the mid 80s. Uh, mainly the universe appears to be actually ripping itself apart uh, recently. By recently, I mean in the last couple billion years, which is actually fairly recent in the history of the universe. So who ordered that? What is indeed going on? This is a plot of, uh, again, some kind of distance between two points in the universe, for example, relative distance between two points, like maybe two galaxies. Just a unitless number. 
uh, as a function of time, you're here now uh, in the past, uh, maybe uh, billions of years ago, uh, maybe 14, uh, there was the Big Bang. And then going into the future, there are various possible scenarios. If you have a huge amount of mass in the universe, of course, the universe expands from the Big Bang and then it collapses on itself. It's like tossing up a ball and it comes back down again. And that's called the Big Crunch. Uh, we, don't, we know that we don't live in such a universe. The universe is pretty dilute. But for a long time, we thought we lived in a universe where it would just sort of coast along. And uh, there were various, uh, I mean, uh, um, up until 1998, we believed this. Uh, but, then, but then it was discovered that the supernovae, uh, through supernova observations, that the universe actually seems to be speeding up its expansion recently. And so um, who ordered that? What's going on? What's the physics behind this? So here's an equation. Uh, you're all familiar with this. You can write down actual, uh, more elegant versions of this equation in, um, in Einstein's uh, covariant formulation. But this is adequate to, dis to explain what's going on here. Uh, mainly, uh, the acceleration uh, between um, uh, two masses or of the universe uh, is uh, minus uh, capital G, which is Newton's gravitational constant times the mass, this you learned in high school, Einstein taught us that not only is there mass, but there's also mass energy, and therefore pressure plays a role. Pressure should be in here along with the mass. Actually, tell you the truth, it's three times the pressure, which is sort of interesting. Um, that comes from the dimensionality of space. And um, so how can you make the acceleration positive if you've got a minus sign here? Anybody? You can't make mass negative. You can make pressure negative. So what happens? Uh, how do you make negative pressure? So, well, I can do that with a bicycle pump if I pull up on it. <laughs> uh, if you, if you um, take one of these uh, solid rubber balls and bounce it, right after it comes off the floor, it's under tension. It's got negative pressure inside of it. There are all sorts of ways we could create some kind of field some kind of stuff in the universe that had a little bit of stuff, it had negative pressure, which at this very, very late time in the expansion of the universe where it's very dilute now, it's just beginning to exert its force, um, therefore pushing the universe apart, anti-gravity force of negative pressure. So that's one candidate for um, creating an acceleration uh, that's negative, that, that is positive. Uh, in the presence of dark matter. Um, uh, that's a candidate which um, you can fit into Einstein's theory of gravity, which is um, the equation that is on the left. Uh, the stuff that's on the right is, of course, as you can see, the mass energy contents of the universe. That's the driving term on the right-hand side of the equation, and on the left-hand side is the dynamics. Um, but another possibility might be that the dynamics is actually a little bit wrong, and you move the modifications that you had to do to the math on the right-hand side, just by algebra, move it to the left, and you call it new dynamics instead of new, new mass energy. I.e., if you do that, what you're saying is that Einstein was wrong, slightly, on some very large scales, and that on very large scales, um, general relativity breaks down. So there are actually a couple of possibilities here. And this is the so-called cosmic conundrum. Is it new gravity, or is it new energy? picture of a couple of major cosmologists here. Um, smoking pipes, by the way. You have to smoke a pipe if you're going to be a cosmologist, right? Um, so this dark energy could be um, caused by uh, negative pressure, some, some kind of funny, very, very dilute content of the universe, some stuff that's around we don't understand. It's got to be invisible. It's got to be uh, very much more dilute than dark matter. And it has the opposite effect. Mainly, it repels. Um, it has negative pressure. Uh, and this kind of thing, actually, it's interesting. Uh, physics actually predicts this. It's interesting. This is actually a prediction of current model of particle physics. There is a kind of springiness, uh, natural springiness in space. By the way, I brought with me a sample. Uh, be very careful uh, when you handle this. Uh, in this box is some dark energy and dark matter. I couldn't separate them this morning. I didn't have time, but uh, there, it's in there. We'll open it a little bit later. 
Um, this is new physics, uh, the fact that um, there's something, there's something um, beyond uh, what is predicted currently. But there's a, um, there's a very natural way of understanding uh, a component of this springiness of space. So suppose you have a box and it's totally empty. There's nothing in it. Okay, and you, and you shield out, it's a, it's a metal box, and you shield out all the electromagnetic radiation, so there's no radio waves coming in, and it's completely empty, uh, and there's no uh, gas in it, you pump it out, nothing. So you would think, well, there's no mass energy inside of this box. But quantum mechanics tells us a slightly different story. Mainly, there are quantum fluctuations at very, very low level, and these quantum fluctuations actually make little uh, particles come into and go out of existence everywhere in this box. There's this boiling um, electron, positron, etc., cetera, um, vacu so-called vacuum polarization going on at some level. This actually creates a um, a, a, a negative pressure of exactly the type that we're looking for. So you say, whoopee, this is great. This is predicted by the standard model of physics. We have now found a uh, candidate for this negative pressure. Uh, but if you just sit down, and you can do this on the back of the envelope, it's not a very hard calculation. You just integrate up the total amount of mass energy due to this stuff and cut it off at some very high energy scale that we know from particle physics. No way around this calculation. And you do it, just, just do it for the electromagnetic field, not all the other fields we know in physics. Just do it with the electromagnetic field. And do that integral. Sum it up, and you get a number for the density of this dark energy, which is uh, 10 to the 120 times larger than our observation. So this has got to be the biggest disagreement in the history of science between, between theory and experiment. In other words, we've just gone from a candidate to a non-candidate, but more important than that, we now have direct evidence of physics beyond the standard model, because the standard model of physics predicts this stuff exists, and it predicts exactly this much of it. So what's wrong? Something obviously, this is exciting, it's starting to get exciting, because this means that uh, there's new physics around the corner, and if we understand this stuff observationally, maybe we'll get some glimpse into this new new physics in the universe. So how can we actually do this? Um, there are two things you can do, two kinds of measurements with your um, cosmic uh, surveyor's toolbox. Uh, you can measure the history of the expansion of the universe, and you do that in a number of different ways by looking at things at different distances and velocities and whatnot. And you can also, through this gravitational lens technique, measure the growth of this dark matter structure through cosmic time. So how do you do that? Um, here's a picture of a computer simulation where uh, the computer has simulated this dark matter structure uh, through um, cosmic time. Uh, this is looking back seven billion light years away, seven billion years away. Uh, this is looking back three billion years, uh, and so this stuff is three billion light years away from the Earth. And you can see that as time proceeds, the uh, structure, of course, grows. It becomes more dense, of course, because gravity, over densities of dark matter become more over dense over time because of the self-gravity, and so it grows. Uh, so this natural growth of dark matter structure um, is expected. And uh, imagine um, that you have a distant galaxy way, way off to the right and your way over here on the left on the Earth, and you look at the light coming from that distant uh, galaxy, and it's got to thread its way past all of these over densities, uh, and, and it's get its, of course, its um, light gets bent, uh, uh, according to Einstein, by all of these over dense regions of dark matter. And it creates a certain distortion on the sky, uh, which you can then look for and map, and everything, of course, as I said before, is in the wrong place as a result of this. This galaxy, as you see this galaxy in a place that's been moved from where it actually is. And there are billions of galaxies in the sky that you can do this with, so there's some hope that you could actually, through a tomographic process, map out 
the dark matter structure not only as a function of coordinates on the sky, but also as a function of cosmic time, if you know the distance to all of these things. And so this is a picture of ordinary graph paper put behind, on the computer of course, uh, a cluster of galaxies with its invisible dark matter, and you can see what it does to the graph paper. This is a mathematical challenge to try to look for this pattern, but we can do that, and we can actually um, directly, therefore, map the warp of space-time uh, back to about half the age of the known universe uh, through these techniques of looking at billions of galaxies and looking at their distortion. So how do you do this? Um, how do you build something to do this in a major way? You've got to have the big picture. Uh, that's to say, it's not good enough to just appoint Hubble Space Telescope at some tiny patch of the sky because you won't see very many of these distant galaxies and you won't be mapping much anyway. Uh, you need to do uh, deep imaging like the Hubble does, but you have to do it over the entire visible sky. And so this was a big homework assignment um, that we took on uh, in the late 90s. Uh, and the, uh, the machine that came out of it is now called the Large Synoptic um, Survey Telescope. It is now in construction. Uh, and it will be in Chile. Um, and this is an artist's conception of how it works in the optical, the optics of it. So um, these, it, it's, it's a very funny kind of optic. Uh, so the light comes down uh, from some distant galaxy, reflects off the primary mirror, off the secondary mirror, off of a tertiary mirror, into the three uh, optical elements inside of a camera. So that's uh, the optical layout. Uh, having all six of these optical surfaces, all six of these optical components allow you, allows you to get a uniquely crisp wide field image, uh, something that is just not possible in optics otherwise. Uh, making this thing in the bottom uh, turned out to be a challenge, but thanks to Charles Simone and Bill Gates, uh, we had early funding to pursue this and it's now almost finished. It's within a couple of months of being finished. Uh, this is a picture of the technicians laying pieces of very purified Pyrex uh, into an oven. Uh, we then heated it up to 1100 degrees uh, centigrade and uh, melted it and we then rotated it and it became, of course, when it's rotating, a liquid becomes a, uh, has a surface that's a parabola um, and then we gradually cooled it as it um, was rotating and then we sat on it. <laughs> Some kind of ownership thing. Anyway, uh, so these are the people that, 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 that helped build it. Um, uh, in the uh, University of Arizona uh, Mirror Lab, this is actually underneath the football bleachers in their stadium. There's enough room to build something like this there. And the reason it's this size is because this is the largest size you could build there and get out uh, because of the supports for the bleachers if anyone's curious. So this is um, 8.4 meters in diameter. Very strange um, mirror as I showed. It's going to be put on a site uh, in northern Chile uh, near an existing observatory. You can see the Gemini South telescope there, the SOAR telescope, uh, and it's going to be put on this little ridge here. We just a few months ago blasted the top of that off and it's now flat, ready to, um, ready to accept this. We let, we let the director blast the top. That's fine. Um, and so, uh, just to give you a, a visceral feel for, for, for how faint this is going to go, going back to that original slide I showed you, imagine uh, you're on the top of a mountain, your eyes are dark adapted, and you're looking out at the distant universe, and you happen to have the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope at your disposal, so you're looking very deep. And you look at a little tiny patch of the sky. Uh, the patch is a quarter the diameter of the moon. So it's, it's a really small patch. That's what this size is. It's a quarter the diameter of the moon, half the radius of the moon here, a uh, little patch of the sky. And in the, sky, in the very deep Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was completed a few years back, you can see, I don't know if you guys can see this, there are a couple of galaxies that you see here and maybe a handful of stars. Uh, we tried recently uh, very hard um, to um, get hold of telescopes uh, in Hawaii and elsewhere and integrate very deeply to find out uh, what this little patch of the sky would look like if we um, tried to imitate the depth of LSST. We almost got that deep, but not quite. And here's the image that we got um, from using the Subaru telescope and a bunch of others 
um, integrating for uh, months. Uh, and in this picture, of course, you see the two galaxies quite easily, but um, actually um, um, uh, you can see about 2,800 other galaxies in the same little piece of the sky. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a tiny part of the 20,000 square degrees, of course, uh, that we're going to be mapping. Uh, so it just gives you a feel for how faint we, we're going to be going. And so this survey is going to, um, the, so the LSST will be finished uh, sometime around 19, uh, uh, <laughs> sometime around 2018. Um, and by, uh, and then we're going to have about a two-year shakedown cruise. Uh, and by about 2020, we'll begin the official survey. The survey will go for 10 years. And so um, many of you will be around uh, during that period of time, and um, this data is going to become public immediately. There's no proprietary time. It's going to be available to curious minds of all ages. Um, and and uh, there's um, agreements we're signing with various outfits that are going to commercial companies that are going to release this data in a user-friendly way um, to all of you. Um, it's going to enable you to discover a lot of stuff on your own. Uh, there are going to be about 4 billion galaxies with distances. Not only are we going to have colors, shapes, images of 4 billion galaxies, but we're going to have a lot of other information that allows you to know where they are and how far away they are. Uh, in the time domain, we're effectively making a movie of the universe. What LSST is going to do, it's so large, and the camera is, is so, so big and, and sensitive, that it can actually um, go to the edge of the optical universe in only 15 seconds exposure. So we're going to take a lot of those 15 second exposures every single night, every year for 10 years of every piece of the sky. We will then see 20 billion, we'll get data in a catalog of 20 billion galaxies and stars. And of those 20 billion galaxies and stars, they're going to be about 22 trillion observations. So this is a huge movie of the universe. We're going to be able to see things move, explode, and um, you're going to be able to make fly-throughs of the reconstructed dark matter over densities uh, in this huge volume of the universe that we'll map out by gravitational lensing. Um, but actually, to tell you the truth, every time uh, scientists have built some new facility that's thousands of times more capable than any of its predecessors, there's, there's been an accidental, uh, serendipitous discovery of something they didn't expect. And so I certainly think that um, this last item here is going to be the legacy, something that we don't, can't even imagine. So just a quick walkthrough of the science capabilities of LSST. That's dark matter and dark energy. Um, this is sort of cool. Um, we are going to be able because of this movie, we're going to be able to see stars move during this 10 years, and we're going to be seeing these streams of stars uh, in our own galaxy and near, nearby galaxies, and we're going to be able to play that movie backwards to reconstruct the history of the formation of our galaxy, which is sort of cool. So mapping the Milky Way. And then uh, those of you that are obsessed with an um, uh, uh, asteroid hitting us, which of course could happen at any time, there are, by the way, um, 100, it's estimated that there are about 100,000 um, very destructive um, Earth-threatening threat, asteroids that we have no idea where they are, but they're around. We know just statistically that they're around. It'd sort of be a nice public service to know where they are and to alert people. So we can see these things uh, because we're making a movie. And so this, for example, is a pilot pr a project that I did several years ago in which uh, on the left is a little tiny piece of the sky, only an arc minute wide, where you see this is one exposure, and you see this, this thing that's moving. And then, uh, and then another exposure, I think this is a half hour later, uh, and the, thing, the moving thing has moved here, and of course you take the difference, and well, this is an asteroid. And nearly every one of our images that we took uh, during that experiment um, had these in it. Uh, they're all over. We live in a swarm of asteroids, some of which are so large uh, that they could actually um, and life on the Earth, and so it'd be sort of nice to know where they are, so that's a public service. Um, we'll find 92% roughly of all the Earth-threatening asteroids, uh, but more importantly, scientifically, this opens the time window. This kind of movie opens this window on the universe. It's a totally new window of a non-static dynamic universe where we can um, look at stuff, new stuff, it's exploding, whatever. 
Um, so in summary, uh, the LSST itself is going to enable multiple probes of, of dark energy and dark, uh, dark matter also, but in, just in terms of dark energy, uh, I told you really in detail, some detail, only about one of them. Mainly um, the ability to, with weak gravitational lensing, to map the dark matter structure, the evolution of the growth of dark matter structure through cosmic time. That, that's, a, that's a really great constraint. That's a good thing to know. Uh, that constrains your theory. If you guys think of a theory of what dark energy is, uh, you, can, you can throw that theory um, at our data. Our data will then challenge that theory. Does your theory agree with our data? Uh, but there's other data that LSST will actually obtain that relates to this. Several other probes. It does multiple probes of dark energy simultaneously. One of them is sort of cool. And, um, and I'll just briefly tell it to you. You've probably heard of this, actually. Uh, so remember the, those pictures I showed you earlier of clusters? Uh, galaxies actually cluster um, because of uh, gravity. Well, that kind of gravitational clustering was actually happening before the hot big bang cooled off and that microwave, what is now microwave radiation, uh, came at us from that sur so-called surface of last scattering, what we see when we look at the cosmic microwave background. All those lumps that you saw in that picture, it wasn't a, it wasn't a flat, uniform cosmic microwave background, it was lumpy. All those lumps are caused by gravitational overdensities of mass inside of that fireball. And that is a natural scale. There is a natural scale. As you saw, looking at that picture, and I can show it to you again at the end, um, there is a natural scale. It wasn't sort of random Gaussian white noise. It was, uh, it was, it had a, it had a scale to it. That scale remains with us to this day throughout the universe. And uh, after this radiation escaped from the hot Big Bang uh, surface of last scattering, after it cooled well enough so that the electrons and protons could recombine and the radiation could escape, that overdensity of dark matter still existed, uh, and it's existed ever since, and that scale has been with us all the time. The scale uh, is about 140 million parsecs. A parsec is three light years. Um, it's sort of like having a cosmic ruler placed everywhere in the universe for you by nature. And so by measuring angles and distances to galaxies uh, and looking at their natural clustering as a function of distance, you can do um, cosmology. You, can, this, you have a ruler out there. You have this scale everywhere, the same ruler everywhere in, in, in this volume of the universe. And you can look at, see what angle it subtends as a function of redshift. And that's another very big um, input. Uh, the technical name for this is baryon acoustic oscillations. Uh, but that's another input, this sort of um, uh, non, non Gaussian, non random um, scale that was introduced by nature early on by the overdensities um, at the Big Bang. Uh, the legacy of that are these uh, rulers that's everywhere in space. You can combine that data with this uh, dark matter probe. And then, of course, uh, another one is uh, supernovae. You can look at very distant supernovae, and they're actually fainter than they ought to be. This is the way dark energy was discovered, after all. Uh, and they're fainter than they ought to be because the universe is being ripped apart. So in the process of the light, between the time between the light was, that was emitted from the supernova and the time it gets into your telescope and camera, the universe has actually expanded, and it's redshifted the light, and it's lowered the energy of those photons. And so the light is dimmer than it should be. All of this hangs together. Uh, we now know for sure from separate, uh, all of these separate different probes, even today from current experiments, that dark energy exists. Who ordered this strange stuff that fills um, more than 70% of the mass energy of the universe? Um, it's got to be new physics. So for those of you that are curious, um, this is a place to go to understand more, not only about the LSST itself, but also uh, some of the science that I've just uh, reviewed for you. Uh, there was a major event, uh, actually uh, very recently, the, uh, in Washington, uh, there's, there's a, something called the National Science Board, and uh, they decided that this uh, telescope should uh, proceed to completion. Uh, that was our last major gate, I think, 
uh, in this project uh, in terms of getting federal uh, funding for it. So I'll stop here and, and ask for your questions. Thank you. By the way, uh, you, can come up and t you, you can come up and take a look inside of this box. Uh, it's got dark energy and dark matter inside of it. So ask me a weird question. Yeah, yeah. I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> so the question is, is the discovery of the Higgs boson uh, related to this. It is, uh, and it isn't. <laughs> and, and it is because it's the discovery of the last missing piece in that puzzle of the standard model of particle physics that was predicted long ago. Uh, bosons uh, in physics are exchange particles uh, for a force. For example, the, the photon is the boson, uh, is the exchange particle for the electromagnetic force. Uh, the Higgs was predicted uh, because of another symmetry in nature, and it had not been discovered, and it was sort of a, a, a thorn in our side. And uh, the discovery of the Higgs is confirmation of the uh, standard model of particle physics. So it's a really nice thing to have found. If we hadn't found the Higgs, then, then something is really strange. Uh, however, it's been known for quite some time, as I've showed you, uh, from both uh, the evidence that I presented to you and from other evidence, uh, that the standard model of particle physics is actually wrong. Uh, that, uh, that is to say, the Higgs is fine, it's expected, uh, but um, it's not the end of the story. And if you ask any high energy physicist, they'll say the same thing, mainly this is an exciting moment, and yet we therefore however know that there is physics beyond the Higgs, even in the Higgs sector. Uh, so the Higgs um, is now increasingly uh, described by high energy physics as the Higgs-like particle, uh, because they know that there's more to come. Uh, there's uh, various other reasons why we know the uh, standard model of particle physics is wrong. Uh, one, one of which is that uh, if it were completely correct, and all the symmetries in it were correct, there would have been an equal number of, of, of positrons and electrons, uh, that's to say matter and, and antimatter would have been equal quantities at the beginning of the universe, and uh, we, the universe would have annihilated it in a giant flash of gamma rays uh, shortly after its creation. We know that's not true, so there's another evidence of a broken symmetry that we don't understand. There was another question right here, there's two of them, you uh, in the front first. No. The uh, question is, is there any relationship between antimatter and dark matter? And the answer is no. Uh, antimatter is another way of, uh, of describing um, um, anti-electrons, anti anti-protons. In other words, for, for every electron, you can have, say, an, uh, a positron. That's an anti-electron. It's got the opposite charge, but all the other quantum numbers are the same. Uh, you can do the same thing with the proton. That's antimatter. We can create antimatter in the universe. In the laboratory, you can do this yourself at home, actually. Um, and uh, no, that's that that those are all uh, those are all particles that are part of the known part of a, of the universe that have nothing to do with dark matter. Yeah, question. Dark matter. Um, yeah, so the question is, what are the most promising candidates? There are a number of them, but one of them actually, in interestingly, uh, comes from a, a symmetry that, we, uh, that the high energy theorists uh, knew was broken, or should be broken, in the standard model of particle physics. So they were thinking beyond the standard model uh, years ago, of course. And they predicted co something called supersymmetry, a new kind of broken symmetry, uh, which, uh, whose particle, um, an exchange particle, uh, could be actually uh, a particle that matches all of the known properties of, uh, of dark matter, mainly it's not relativistic, it's relatively heavy, it's slowly moving, it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't shine, it doesn't radiate, uh, but it interacts by the weak, maybe by the weak interaction, so one of the interactions in physics, and so um, that particle was called a WIMP uh, for uh, physicists have these great names. Uh, that particle was called a WIMP, uh, standing for um, weak interacting massive particle. 
And so there is a natural uh, physics, uh, naturally occurring idea in, in, uh, beyond the standard model of particle physics for, uh, for those things. But very frankly, um, there are many more. And if you ask any of these theorists, they'll, they'll list a long laundry list of possible um, broken symmetries uh, in physics beyond the standard model that would be likely candidates for uh, the dark matter particle. You had a question over here. Wow, you know, so, so um, that's an interesting question. The question was, does dark matter have antimatter? And since I have no idea what dark matter is, I could say, yeah, sure. Uh, but uh, I have no idea. Um, uh, but actually, um, um, dark matter is not, uh, we know that dark matter is not charged. So it can't be antimatter in the same sense that we have anti-electrons, which are positrons. Uh, but there may be um, another side to dark matter. That's to say, it could, be ha it could have a quantum number uh, which is symmetric, uh, whose symmetry is broken, and so it could not, not be charge, it'd be some other quantum number besides charge that is anti. And so you could have, um, you could have, uh, you, you could, you could have these, these uh, supersymmetric particles and, they, and they're antiparticle, for example, and they both would be members of this family of dark matter particles. Uh, question over here. So the question is, is, it, is, is the mass that's bending the light uh, in the universe may be due to black holes rather than some, some of this mysterious dark matter. Actually, black holes are pretty mysterious in their own right. But we know uh, black holes should exist. Uh, they're actually uh, pretty well known to exist. We have one, one, by the way, in the center of our own galaxy. It's been mapped pretty nicely. Uh, uh, this happens when you have a, so much mass inside of a, such a small volume that even light can't escape. And so that creates a black hole. Uh, black holes have certain properties. Uh, they can be charged. Uh, they have angular momentum, they have linear momentum, and they have mass. And uh, we know that they exist theoretically, and I think we know they exist experimentally. However, uh, many folks have, been, uh, have tried over the years to imagine a population of black holes that could mimic the properties that we now know that dark matter has, and it just doesn't work. Uh, there would be so many of them that they, that they would have collided with the Earth or at least deflected some of the planets. So, uh, and that's just one of the many reasons why black holes aren't um, a, a proper candidate for dark uh, matter, uh, aside from the fact that black holes can be charged. One more question, somebody. How about a really weird question? Do I see some? Ah, right over here, I can't see. Visually challenged. Okay. Green shirt. Green shirt, yes, thank you. Oh, good question. Uh, so wouldn't um, an accelerating universe eventually exceed the cosmic speed limit, the speed of light? And, um, and, 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 and uh, the brief answer to that is something before Einstein's general relativity, something called special relativity. Uh, mainly, uh, there's a so-called velocity addition theorem that uh, in a um, universe where the speed of light is always the same everywhere, there's a universal speed limit, and you consider clocks and positions uh, in different observers in different positions in the universe, you very su suddenly can drive a formula for the relationship of uh, adding velocities. And so if you uh, shine a laser, if you're on a very, very fast rocket ship and you sh shine a laser beam forward, you'd think, well, isn't that light traveling a little bit faster than the velocity of light? And the answer is no. And so the universe, um, because of the velocity addition theorem of, of special relativity, uh, the universe uh, can never exceed the velocity of light expanding, but something that will happen um, to the universe, uh, unless somebody comes in and um, changes everything, uh, is, that, is that it will become sufficiently dilute that the distance between uh, galaxies uh, will grow to the point where you can't, uh, the population of folks, if there are any that live on these galaxies then, in a hundred billion years from now, um, they won't be able to see the distant, uh, won't be see, they, they won't see anything in their, their universe would be completely empty because they, um, 
it'd be so dilute that the most distant, uh, mo nearest galaxy is too distant to see. Uh, if it keeps on going, then there's enough time that elapses that uh, protons will actually decay. Protons actually are not are thought to be slightly unstable, but on very long time scales, not to worry. Um, and so the universe would simply dissipate into nothingness. That's the end state. So thank you. And on that cheerful note. On that cheerful note.